All right. You know, over the years, um, we've gotten plenty of feedback from our fellows to try to provide education in a broad category of professional and medical topics. So our topic today is not necessarily about infectious diseases knowledge or medical facts for that matter, but it's more about the way we think and react when we practice medicine. Now, when, uh, when healthcare provi providers or the general public, when they talk about biases, we may be inclined to think that they are talking about, for example, uh, inequality in healthcare or maybe how people form opinions. But our focus today will be on a different type of bias, cognitive bias, which is a distinct form of bias that's very relevant to the practice of medicine. Now, cognitive bias is a feature of the way humans process and act on information. An understanding of uh, this type of bias is critical to making sure that we have the most objective basis to obtain information and to act in the best interest of our patients. So today, um, we're going to focus on 10 important types of cognitive bias and provide examples in the form of a quiz. Now, since we're hosting this session virtually, I'm going to ask our fellows to speak up and provide what they feel to be the best answer to the clinical case. And of course, the faculty are invited to jump in as well. So um, any questions about this format? And I'm just curious if um, our fellows have had any, uh, any uh, training on cognitive bias. Maybe this is something that you learned about in college. I don't know if medical schools include this in their curriculum, but nevertheless, um, I'm, I welcome any questions or comments about what we're gonna talk about today. So what is bias? Well, bias in general, the term derives from an old French word, and forgive me, my French is not very good, but it's a BA, uh, meaning sideways, askance, or against the grain. And bias is a closed-minded or prejudicial opinion or feeling about an idea or thing. And we all know that there's different categories of bias. In, in sociology, we talk about prejudicial bias, and that's uh, probably the most well-known form. It can occur against a person's race, ethnicity, gender, or religion. And we have statistical bias in science, and we, we all are familiar with that. It occurs when a population sample is disproportionately weighted. And in thought, cognitive bias results from errors in thinking, perceiving, recollecting, or inferring that can affect the way we act or express a behavior. And the thing about biases are, we all know that they're common. They tend to be adaptive. In other words, they're a feature of the human mind um, where we try to, to cope with um, what we're presented in an efficient way. Although they do improve the efficiency of choice, they can also obstruct or impede our perceptions. So uh, sometimes they're beneficial, but a lot of times um, they can uh, interfere with the way that, that we perceive information that we're provided. So the foundation of uh, cognitive biases really centers upon a contrast between intuitive and analytical thinking. So we define analytical thinking in the same way a computer functions, by taking in objective data, analyzing the information provided, and producing an intelligent solution. And it would be great if we could always think and process information in this way, but we all know that humans are not computers and um, cognitive biases occur when humans utilize our intuitive thinking. So um, a question out to the fellows, who can give the audience a definition of intuitive thinking? What is intuitive thinking? So what does it mean when we use our intuition uh, when we look at a medical case? Well, not to put anybody on the spot. Well, did I hear did I hear somebody uh, was somebody about to give us an answer? All right. Well, um, I just said like, I based on your past experiences. Yeah, you know, in, intuitive thinking means uh, going with your first instinct. It's it's really another word for it is instinctual thinking. Yeah, like doing it without any logic or analysis. 
Right. It's going with your instinct. Another word for it is kind of like your gut feeling. So intuitive thinking is an instinctual or, or sort of your gut instinct about how to decide on a case. And we all know that that's very different than analytical thinking. Um, so it's going with one's first instinct and reaching decisions quickly based on automatic cognitive processes. And we do this a lot in our, in our medical thinking. I think we can all recognize that. And um, so the, the foundations of, uh, of cognitive bias are, are, are really based upon, and this is for your historical information, two psychologists. Their names are Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, um, who started practicing in the 1970s. And in kind of a collaboration over two decades, they identified a lot of these uh, types of cognitive biases and published on them. So they're really uh, uh, responsible for um, identifying types of cognitive bias. And there are several types of cognitive biases that I talk about here in this slide. So they can be biases uh, specific to groups, biases that affect decision making, those that affect judgment, uh, biases that affect our memory, and then lastly, biases that affect our motivation. And um, so, you know, so it, as much as we uh, may not really realize, intuitive thinking rather than analytical thinking is a cornerstone of medicine. The reason for that is that our access to complete patient data is limited, our time to make medical decisions is fixed, and it always seems like not long enough, and our brains have finite processing power. I know my colleague, uh, Dr. Tony, if he's on the session, is a, a fan of, of uh, the Star Trek series. And I always think about uh, Commander Data as having um, that sort of analytical mind that, uh, that always takes all the information available about a clinical uh, in a clinical, excuse me, a, uh, uh, a, a issue that's come up um, that needs to be considered and gives the best analytical advice uh, to the commander, to uh, Jean-Luc. And um, the, the ironic thing about commander data is he's always trying to be more human. And, um, and so we're not all uh, commander data. We, we don't all have computer, co computer minds. And so we have to use this intuitive thinking in order to make a decision. And we may try to use our analytical thinking whenever possible, but oftentimes we fall back to the use of what, what is known as heuristics or mental shortcuts and intuitive thinking when pressure, time constraints, and other factors force us to do so. Sometimes that works out in the end. You know, if we have a gut feeling about what a case is, we may turn out to be right. But in other circumstances, it can lead to flawed clinical decisions and can impede our ability to diagnose or properly care for patients. And in, in a different way, um, we use intuitive thinking when we review publications and even when we react in a crisis. I think all of us can think about uh, instances in the last two years for the COVID-19 pandemic where maybe we didn't have all the information we needed and we needed to react in kind of an intuitive way rather than an analytical way. So, um, so th that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, consideration of how cognitive bias affects us in medicine in many different ways. Now, there are at least a hundred types minimum of cognitive biases, and um, it's impossible to discuss every one of them in this talk. And many of you who take an interest in this topic may need to go to um, do some searching on the internet, look at uh, identified types of cognitive bias and, and read more about it. But it's important to be aware of the most relevant ones. And, um, and an understanding of cognitive bias can help us be aware of why we make the choices we do, can help improve our analytic thinking and help us perceive if we're making the right decisions for our patients. So, what follows is uh, 10 clinical cases, and each of them are associated with an important type of cognitive bias. And I, it's kind of a format for us to discuss them and, and to uh, choose the best answer for the type of cognitive bias that's, that's present. 
So um, this is our first question, and um, and I'm just going to ask for the fellow's input. We'll discuss them, and then we'll talk about the right answer, and we'll also talk about any of the other examples of bias that I've identified among the choices when appropriate. So if everyone's ready, this is question number one. Um, Irene, um, an internal medicine resident, is speaking to another internal medicine resident about a new patient admission. Um, she identifies a 56-year-old female patient who's admitted with fever and a cough. She identifies it as fever and a cough. So Irene concludes she must have pneumonia, and this is even before she sees the patient. So Irene identifies a description of fever and a cough with the patient having a diagnosis of pneumonia. So for our fellows, which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is it what is known as the framing effect, the bandwagon effect, attribution bias, anchoring bias, or false consensus? So uh, does any of the fellows want to uh, offer us a, uh, a selection? Which type of bias is present in this clinical case? Anchoring bias. Anchoring bias. Is that you, Christian? That was me, David. That was that was oh, David, I'm but sorry, I agree David. with him. Slightly All right. anchoring sorry, bias. David. Anchoring bias. Okay. Thanks, anybody Christian. have any other choices? Anybody uh, want to select any other type? Well, if not, uh, David. Um, uh, maybe you've had some previous training in this, and and tell me what uh, what your definition of anchoring bias is. So the way I see it is um, possibly like a past experience may have uh, caused her to um, to come to her first conclusion of pneumonia. Um, basically, um, maybe she had a patient where they had a fever and cough, and it was a pneumonia, and now she, so she thinks. Basically, uh, whenever she sees a patient with fever and cough, now she thinks every patient has pneumonia. So it's using too little information to come to uh, a conclusion. Yeah, I think that's that's really correct. And thank you for uh, for contributing that. So this is anchoring bias. And so anchoring bias is when we rely too much on the initial presentation of the patient or the data presented and we fail to revise our initial first impression, despite compelling information presented later. So typically a patient's being presented and maybe we latch too much on the chief complaint or on uh, the reason for presentation. We form a basis for a diagnosis in our mind and then our mind kind of shuts everything out and we fail to take in all the information that's presented um, and, and revise that initial conclusion. So I, I like to think of anchoring bias as kind of reacting on a first impression rather than thinking about a case and revising what you initially think about or what, what you initially suspected. So we're off, as providers, we're often pressed into anchoring bias by the need to document a diagnosis. So, you know, our our senior or our attending may tell us, you know, what is this patient being admitted for? And then we have to provide an initial diagnosis. And then everybody else on the team latches onto that without considering the entire case. And uh, what's more about anchoring bias is it can be further confounded by what's known as confirmation bias. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So with all of these cases, I always like to, um, to, to include how do we prevent this? So how do we become resistant to anchoring bias? Well, for all of us, I think we need to temper our initial conclusions about something before all the information is presented or available. Don't just latch on the chief complaint or the reason for presentation. Have an opportunity to listen to the entire case and then form a conclusion and kind of resist the idea of anchoring on to any one thing that's presented initially so that you avoid this type of, uh, of scenario. So that's what anchoring bias is. And just to talk about um, some other biases that uh, I may not present as a clinical case, but is important because I mentioned them as among the choices. 
Uh, framing effect, does anybody know what framing effect is? So um, when when sometimes I succumb to the fact that when when I, um, you know, I may tell uh, someone who's presenting me a case, paint me a picture, right? So framing effect is the idea to paint to kind of paint a picture, uh, drawing conclusions based upon the way something is presented. Um, we also talk about, uh, we mentioned attribution bias. Attribution bias is when we attribute something to someone's behavior based upon their character rather than any situational factor. So we may say, well, um, this particular person acted this way, um, so we attribute some, someone's behavior um, to, to what we know to be their character rather than the situation. And to, to have a false consensus is when we believe, quote unquote, everybody believes that when in fact, not as many people as we think may believe that fact. So that's forming a false consensus. So our answer of course is anchoring bias and uh, we'll go on to the next example. Okay, so I hope everybody has the hang of how we're going to present these cases. Question number two, Andrew is certain that a bacteremic patient with a cardiac murmur has endocarditis. So he meticulously examines the patient for stigmata, but he overlooks the patient's tenderness in the lumbar spine. Days later, a TEE is normal, but a lumbar MRI reveals vertebral osteomyelitis. So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is this confirmation bias? Is it uh, diagnosis momentum? Is it anchoring bias, which we just talked about? It is, is it automation bias? Or is it framing effect, which we talked about as well? So for the fellows, which of these um, is demonstrated in this example? This is a uh, clinician who um, sees a patient with a cardiac murmur, uh, automatically feels that the patient has endocarditis, goes looking for stigmata of endocarditis, but overlooks a, the patient's report of tenderness in the lumbar spine. Later on, uh, not endocarditis, but vertebral osteomyelitis is, is diagnosed. So anyone have a, uh, a suggestion? Anyone want to go for diagnosis momentum or is this the framing effect or is this confirmation bias? Anybody? Well, to answer your question, if we thought it was diagnosis momentum, I feel like that's more so when we don't like when we don't check other um, people's diagnosis per se like oh this is what they've been saying all along and we keep it going like that momentum continues um i'm not sure if this is a um confirmation bias though well uh, i appreciate that um alberto thank you for uh for for mentioning those those things any other uh anybody else want to give an opinion if not we'll move ahead and um and yeah, this is uh, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is one of the most important types of cognitive biases to know. And, and confirmation bias is when we look for confirming evidence that supports our perception. In this case, the fact that the patient, we felt the patient had endocarditis and we ignore other evidence that refutes it, even when the contrary evidence is more compelling or persuasive. And if we think about it, each of us is more convinced by the certainty of our perception than by all the evidence in the world to the contrary. And confirmation bias is really the foundation of conspiracy theories. And it's also why social media sites are so enthralling to people. Because um, when we're convinced about an opinion about something that we hold, we tend to ignore any other evidence to the contrary. And we know, for example, that among uh, people who have vaccine vaccination hesitancy or are convinced that va vaccines are bad, that they can be sort of fed um, 
they have a tendency to pursue information that confirms their suspicion. And they can reach a point where no other compelling evidence can convince them to go against their opinion. So we need to reflect when we may have uh, or understand when we may have confirmation bias about a case because um, this can profoundly affect our ability to consider other opinions. And, you know, as a matter of fact, um, I, I'm aware of a, a public figure and businessman who, who, who uh, this person is, is not important, but uh, uh, I, I read about their, their style in business and they begin every work discussion with a colleague with the basic premise, I am wrong, convince me of why that is true. And I think having this approach may be a good defense mechanism against succumbing to confirmation bias. Um, so if each of us thinks I'm wrong, convince me of why this is true, I think we're open to consider other opinions and maybe not locked into what we feel like it may be a certainty. Um, so confirmation bias is an important one to know. And, um, and so I thought I would present it in this case. Any questions about confirmation bias, about anything that we presented so far? If not, so this is confirmation bias and we'll move on to the next example. All right, so question number three, Wyatt adopts the care of a patient with an extensive workup in an outside hospital, finally diagnosed with tuberculosis based upon positive AFB sputums, a right upper lung mass, and a non-invasive non -invasive lung imaging. The patient uh, was actually started on RIPE therapy at the outside hospital and, continue, and continued on it uh, when transferred to your facility. No direct biopsy of the lung mass was ever performed. I think it was felt that the uh, patient had positive AFB sputums and, uh, and, and on that basis treatment was started. Three months later, fo uh, follow-up CT lung imaging reveals that the mass is enlarging um, despite anti-TB therapy. Wyatt finally presses for a CT-directed biopsy and Nocardia Nova is diagnosed. So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? And again, um, Wyatt adopts a patient transferred from an outside hospital with a diagnosis, continues the treatment that's recommended, and then ultimately a different diagnosis ends up um, uh, ultimately uh, being decided upon. So is this the framing effect? Um, we talked about the framing effect before. I think you can see maybe that perhaps the, uh, the diagnosis was framed to Wyatt in a certain way from the outside hospital. Is it the Hawthorne effect? Is it diagnosis momentum? Is it automation bias or is it omission bias? Who wants to venture a guess about what type of, co of cognitive bias is displayed in this case? Alberto, I think you were discussing uh, a diagnosis momentum uh, for the earlier question. What do you think about diagnosis momentum in this case? So I'm not uh, convinced it's diagnosis momentum because I feel like with diagnosis momentum, you're kind of accepting what someone else said before you and you're not really checking um what or how they got to that diagnosis so i'm i'm here um because he got the ct biopsy um i'm i'm not convinced this would be diagnosis momentum Actually, anybody but, else but he did no, oh well, go ahead Sorry. No, go no, please. No, no, no. I'll finish. Well, well just uh, I was just going to say that maybe because it was 3 months later um, the diagnosis momentum is what caused that delay in, in getting that CT biopsy. Anybody else have an opinion? Um, is this diagnosis momentum think, or not? I think Alberto, I think Alberto might have been right. I think this is a, this might be a diagnosis momentum. You know, you're accepting a previous diagnosis without checking it out. So, um, I guess I'll probably go with uh, C diagnosis momentum. 
Very good. Well, the answer to this, uh, and remember that these all these cases are are synthesized. They're they're invented. I, I I wanted to play. I wanted to place the the a scenario that I thought best reflected the type of cognitive bias that was present. So you know we can we can debate whether or not the the compendium of evidence there was sufficient to uh, meet the criteria for a particular type of cognitive bias. But I felt that this did represent uh, diagnosis momentum. So. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, diagnosis momentum is the tendency to accept a previous diagnosis when sufficient time has passed and the perceived preponderance of evidence has made it seemingly irrefutable. So this, this is a, a time-saving, intuitive, or heuristic mechanism that humans use to accept that which is so, so, that, so, that has, um, in so many words, already been decided. And it's really why some misdiagnoses occur. Think about it. You you are you accept a transfer, or you see a patient who with an accepted transfer from another, either what you may consider to be reputable or or less reputable, or you know more foundational institution with a certain diagnosis. You've got uh, six other patients to see, or you only have ten minutes to conclude the case it's going to be your natural tendency to accept that diagnosis. I mean, surely three months have passed and this diagnosis must be the correct one. But in fact, um, you know, diagnosis momentum can be a reason why some misdiagnoses occur. And so, you know, the purpose of being aware of diagnosis momentum is really to be aware of the fact that you can conclude that a previous diagnosis is correct and be wrong. And so the way to prevent diagnosis momentum from leading to misdiagnosis is really to vet each diagnosis you're given with sufficient critical weight to satisfy your standard of evidence. And so um, it's not always true that an outside diagnosis is correct. And, you know, I, I, in particular, I want to call out uh, our, you know, our institution, Moffitt Cancer Center, because they particularly... Um, receive a lot of transfers of patients from the outside. And I think the clinicians there in oncology and, you know, we in infectious disease, I think we do our due diligence and we try to at all of our institutions to satisfy a diagnosis, to look at the biopsies, to get all the information that's, um, that's available in order to meet our standard. And so it's really important not to let diagnosis momentum lead you into the wrong diagnosis. So credit to all our institutions. I was taught, um, taught as a medical student, trust but verify. Exactly. And that that is, uh, I think maybe that's really the key sort of, uh, of concept to consider. Trust but verify. You know, you can have a misdiagnosis from the weightiest or, or most influential institution. And on the other hand, the, the transfer center in our community can do equally a good job, but but each of them should meet a standard of evidence. Well put. All right, and just to talk about a couple of other biases that I mentioned here, um, does anybody know what the Hawthorne effect is? So the Hawthorne effect is the, the, the perception that individuals modify their behavior because they're being observed. So, if you call your, your patient three times a week to find out if they're taking their medication, they're going to take it. But if you stop calling them, they're going to revert to their old behavior. So be aware of the Hawthorne effect. Um, the fact that you know you're being watched will make you more compliant or more um, likely to pursue a certain behavior. Uh, when that is missing, you'll go back to your, um, your previous behavior. Omission bias. And has anybody heard of omission bias? Um, this is really fascinating, and it also has a facet in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, omission bias is the fact that individuals prefer the harm caused by the omission of an act over the equal, lesser, or perhaps imperceptible harm caused by the actions themselves. So think about vaccination, right? Um, we, we often ask our, ourselves, why does a patient prefer the potential, potentially lethal threat of COVID-19 infection over the 
almost the tiny or infinitesimally small risks of vaccination. Well, that is because of omission bias. For some reason, people prefer the risk by not doing something over the potentially small risk of, uh, or I should say they prefer the, they prefer the risk um, of, of not getting something done over the smaller risk of getting something done. And the reasons why I think are, are really worthy of our thought and, uh, and research. So that's omission bias. All right, moving on to question number four. Um, and this is, involves Bruce, a non-immunocompromised patient who hears a speculative interview from Dr. Anthony Fauci regarding the eventual need for fourth doses of COVID-19 vaccine in more groups. He contacts his physician and is told by his physician that his three doses of Pfizer vaccine are sufficient. Despite this, he goes to his local pharmacy, misrepresents his health status at a local pharmacy and receives a fourth vaccine dose or a second booster less than two months after his first booster. So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is it framing effect? The Hawthorne effect, which we both of which we talked about, authority bias, the bandwagon effect, or omission bias. Does anybody have an opinion about this one? Which one of these is demonstrated in this scenario? Now, maybe um, you could argue um, that more than one uh, potential bias is here. Who thinks this might be the bandwagon effect? If anybody knows about the bandwagon like, effect. Sounds like something that could be bandwagon. You pretty much just go in the same train as everybody else. So if somebody said it, then it must be true. So mm -hmm. and somebody did it before you, then I might as well just do it myself. I don't know. That's what it kind of feels like. Good thought. And in, in some ways you can, you know, this case involves an authority figure. So Yes, that's what I was going to say. Like, um, it also sounds like some authority um, bias because he is giving um, Dr. Fauci more authority than his local um, physician. And so, um, that, so because of that authority <coughs> bias, he's going with that um, recommendation or I guess um, idea, I guess, that he needs another vaccine. Very, very well put. Any other thoughts from uh, anybody else in the group before we talk about the answer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think um, I think the correct answer here from among all these choices, um, uh, thank you, Alberto, is authority bias. And uh, so authority bias is also something we should be aware of in, in medicine, which is basically that we trust authority figures more than those who may be giving more suitable advice who are closest to us. And some persons are more influenced by authority figures than others. We've seen this time and time again in the COVID-19 pandemic. And remember that uh, authority figures may not be medically trained. An authority figure for someone may be Joe Rogan. It may be one of, you know, one of the conspiracy theorists online. Um, we, you know, we often um, ask ourselves, why do we, uh, why, why do we have patients that are not willing to listen to their personal physician recommend a vaccine, but they do trust online figures that they consider to be authorities? And it's important to remember that all authority figures are human, and they may not always be infallible. And we've seen that, uh, you know, from different authority figures throughout the pandemic who um, may um, make a recommendation and then have to um, clarify that. Um, so all authority figures are not infallible, but then again, neither is science, right? Science is not an infallible um, type of, of, of discipline. Science is always correcting itself and, and making clarifications based on new evidence or new information that's scientifically vetted. So, be, I think it's important for us to be aware of authority bias in our patients and to a certain extent in the medical discipline among professionals as well. So the way that you prevent authority bias is to weigh all opinions, listen carefully to the advice and counsel of both authority figures 
and those inform people who know us best. Sometimes our personal physicians or even our colleagues or friends are better um, at offering opinions than an authority figure in the national uh, sphere who may not know us. And we need to stress that in our patients and understand when they have authority bias. So the diagnosis here is authority bias. Now I have a, uh, a bonus question here, and it involves the same patient. When confronted by the pharmacist later the same week when his vaccine records are reviewed, Bruce says, at least three of my neighbors got a second booster before I did. So maybe this one is easier. Which of these following biases are demonstrated in the above scenario? Framing effect, Hawthorne effect, authority bias, bandwagon effect, or omission bias? Probably bandwagon this time now. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else, so, then it's perfectly fine, right? <laughs> right. So, um, and, and we all recognize this bias as well. Um, so this is the bandwagon effect. It's the reason for fads. It's the reason why we all bought fidget spinners a few years ago. Everybody's doing it, so it must be the right thing. And uh, there's been a variety of, of uh, examples of the bandwagon effect that we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've seen some groups seemingly more on the ivermectin bandwagon or the hydroxychloroquine bandwagon than on the vaccine bandwagon, unfortunately. So I think it's important to be aware of the bandwagon effect. Um, also the way that, um, you know, we practice as, as clinicians. Um, you know, if there's a new treatment, it's a natural te tendency for us to get on the bandwagon to try out that tre treatment, especially if we perceive that all of our colleagues are participating in the same activity. So be aware of the bandwagon effect, and I think it'll help you with your decision making. So question number five, Justine hears a presentation from a colleague transferring a patient's care from an outside hospital concerning a 42-year-old male patient that she describes as having a small lung mass, biopsy negative for cancer. Now, as we often perceive, at least at our facility, um, maybe at Tampa General and Moffitt, uh, no records were provided and no immediate workup is planned. A quantiferon is negative, and the x-ray is not personally reviewed. A six-month follow-up scan is planned. And three months later, the patient begins having hemoptysis, and an urgent PET scan reveals a metabolically active 15 mil millimeter right middle lobe mass suspicious for neoplastic disease. And unfortunately, a biopsy confirms non-small cell lung cancer. So um, this is a patient that uh, Justine uh, hears a presentation as having a small lung mass biopsy negative for cancer. Um, she accepts the diagnosis, the patient is treated, and then ultimately, unfortunately, the wrong diagnosis occurs. So is this the framing effect, the Hawthorne effect, authority bias, the bandwagon effect, or omission bias? Anybody have an opinion? I think we've described all the biases in this option in this question. So all of you should be familiar with all of the options. So I think that this, um, for unless anyone has an opinion, I think this is clearly the framing effect, right? And, um, and we talked about it before, and our diagnosis is going to be heavily influenced by the way information is presented. And so I think it's Im imperative for all of us as clinicians, when we hear information about a case, to ask ourselves, is the messenger a reliable witness? And is all the information presented um, been shared with us? And the framing effect, you know, when we, when we, st when we um, ask a colleague or when you're presenting, if your attending asks you, you know, paint me a picture of the case, I, I think we as the, um, the people receiving the information, we, we need to be aware of the fact that there's really no substitute to reviewing the information ourselves first to form your own conclusions. As um, I think it was uh, Alberto said, to trust but verify. 
to ask questions and get clarifications when information presented is less clear. And lastly, to trust our own eyes and ears in an objective sense. So um, be aware of the fact that a case can be presented three different ways and it can lead to different conclusions and make sure that we verify the information that's presented to our standard of evidence. So this was a case of the framing effect. All right, moving on to question number six. Inez performs a consultation on a 43-year-old clergyman who is admitted with fever and a murmur. The workup reveals Staphylococcus bacteremia and a TE confirms endocarditis. When questioned, um, the patient denies risk factors for endocarditis, includes, including IV drug abuse. And in fact, uh, the patient is uh, somewhat indignant about the allegation. No further workup is performed and the patient's IV antibiotic treatment is being arranged. Just before discharge, the patient is found passed out in his room and is resuscitated with naloxone. Now, how many of us have had a case like this? Uh, has anybody had a case uh, sort of like this about uh, a patient that we uh, managed who surprised us in the end despite being denying a particular behavior? I think many of us have experienced this. So is this false consensus, self-serving bias, authority bias, moral luck, or halo effect? Anybody want to give us a guess? Is this a halo effect? Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent choice, uh, Tom. Anybody want to agree with Tom about the halo effect? Well, um, indeed, this is the halo effect. So, um, uh, so Tom, uh, what is your understanding of the halo effect? Um, the tendency if to have a positive, um, what your impression of a person um, affect your judgment in some other way or your impression in another way that may or may not truly be related. Excellent. So all of us have a tendency to assign virtue or non-virtue to patients uh, based upon what we understand about their traits, and then to base our assessment and treatment plans on that categorization. And similarly, the reverse halo effect is when we do the opposite. If we see a patient as non-virtuous, we may come to conclusions about a particular behavior or a particular risk factor. And so we need to be aware of the halo effect because I think all of us have been kind of affected by this. We make, uh, we, we make um, assumptions based on our perception of virtue or, or non-virtue for a, a patient. And we need to resist that because we oftentimes will be very surprised. The truth of the matter is all humans are fallible and the subject to both positive and negative personal traits. And in our assessment of patients, we need to strive to see them as neither good nor bad. They're just patients, they're just human beings, and they're susceptible to the fallacies and the, in, and the, the fallibility uh, of any other patient. So, um, so be aware of the halo effect um, in these cases. Very good, nice job, Tom. All right, let's consider this next one. Three specialists are consulted to see a 62-year-old male patient with abdominal pain. The GI specialist evaluates the patient, diagnoses diverticulitis, and recommends a lower GI endoscopy. The general surgeon evaluates the patient, diagnoses a GI perforation, and recommends an exploratory lap. Meanwhile, the ID clinician evaluates the patient and while agreeing with the surgeon, starts the patient on an empiric course of ceftriaxone and flagyl. So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is it false consensus, Maslow's hammer, availability cascade, moral luck, or zero risk bias? Does anybody wanna give a guess about which cognitive bias is displayed in this example? 
I know that some of these we haven't talked about, but I'll, I'll uh, discuss each one uh, when the question is over. So, um, so uh, I think um, most of you won't be familiar with the name of this phenomenon, but you are, you will be familiar with the principle. Um, has anyone heard the expression, when you're a hammer, everything else is a nail? How many people have heard about that? Because this is um, the type of cognitive bias known as Ma Maslow's hammer. And it really occurs because uh, of the goodwill that we all have to use our tools, and, and also because of the need for anything to justify its own reason for being. It's also known as the golden hammer principle or the law of the instrument. So, um, so each of us has a tool to offer um, in uh, infectious disease, we have our antimicrobials, our, our anti-infectives. In surgery, um, they have their, their cold steel to offer. And in GI, we might have endoscopy to offer. So each of our, um, our therapeutic plans are likely to be weighted by the tools that we have within our tool belt. So we want to avoid the, the concept of Maslow's hammer by thinking of the whole toolbox not, a ju not just about the one tool or few tools that we have, and also to know when to withhold the hammer. And in infectious disease, as you all know, we have a concept, a well-known concept called antimicrobial stewardship that is really the exact opposite of Maslow's hammer, which is one of the things I love about our specialty, the idea that sometimes it's better to withhold our hammer. So uh, Maslow's hammer is something that's important for us to consider. Sometimes our tool may not be the best one, and we may need to instrument to institute antimicrobial stewardship. And I think to a certain extent, surgery is also, um, I think surgeons have the discipline to know when their tool is not the best option. And oftentimes when their tool is not the best option, our tool is, unfortunately, at least in their mind. So what, what are um, some other um, of the cognitive biases that that I might want to mention in this example. So does anybody know what availability cascade is? So I, I like to refer to availability cascade as the snowball effect. It's when an express perception gains traction in society and then reinforces a belief in the public's mind. So an example of this would be kind of like the culture of fear that we all remember that struck America after 9-11, um, where uh, a terrorist was around every corner and we needed to be careful and avoid public transit, transit, not go on airplanes, not live our lives because of the threat of terrorism. So this is really the snowball effect in the, in the, patient, in the, um, in the public's mind, the availability cascade. Moral luck is when we explain an individual's circumstances or outcome based upon a moral judgment even when the circumstances are out of control of the subject. That person um, got cancer, for example, because of, of um, um, the moral judgment that we make about them rather than other circumstances. That's moral luck. And zero risk bias is kind of interesting. That's the tendency to prefer the complete elimination of risk over alternatives which may result in overall greater risk reduction. And this is why people ha hoarded toilet paper during the pandemic or hoarded things. That's, this is the entire concept of hoarding. We can't control a lot of different factors that happen during the COVID-19 pan pandemic. But one thing we can control is um, not being out of toilet paper and not having our bathroom habits affected by COVID-19. So this is what is known as zero risk bias. And I think it's kind of fascinating and explains a lot of the behavior that we've seen during the pandemic. So we just have a couple more cases here. So I'm gonna move on to case number eight in the time we have. Um, Jordan sees and diagnoses five patients in a single morning with acute COVID in the emergency room. This obviously happened during one of the COVID surges. The sixth patient he sees presents with fever and a cough. And Jordan says to himself, there's no way I'm getting a six straight patient with COVID. And he admits the patient to a regular floor. Although the patient initially tests negative with a PCR test, the next day a repeat test is positive. 
So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is it false consensus, status quo bias, availability cascade, declinism, or gambler's fallacy? Does anybody want to give a guess? So he sees five patients, the sixth one come, comes along and he says, there's no way this can be COVID. I'm, I'm sending them to a regular floor. Well, if there's, if there's no one uh, willing to give a guess, this is um, the answer here is a gambler's fallacy. So gambler's fallacy is the belief that the more often a diagnosis occurs, the less likely it is to occur in the immediate future. I've had three cases of nocardia this month. This can't be another case. This is definitely something else. So when we, when we uh, review cases, when we consider a diagnosis in our patients, we want to avoid thinking that future possibilities are weighted on by past events. We don't want to necessarily think that things only occur in threes, they can occur in fours. We want to consider each case on its own merits. And, um, and, and so we want to avoid gambler's fallacy when we decide on a case. Any questions or comments about gambler's fallacy? If not, we just have two more cases to consider. Um, so this is uh, question number nine. Jane accepts an online promotional opportunity about a new antimicrobial agent for cellulitis that is much more expensive than other antimicrobials in its class, but offers greater convenience in dosing. How many different products in infectious disease do we know that meets that particular description? Later that week, she requests the new agent for her patient over the formulary agent, which she has used in the past. When facing resistance from pharmacy about it, she reasons, I just wanted to try it out. So which of the following biases is demonstrated in the above scenario? Is it fundamental attribution error? Is it status quo? bias? Is it mere exposure effect? Is it hindsight bias or is it information bias? Anybody want to give a guess? It's probably the mere exposure effect. Anybody? Very good. Anybody else want to venture a guess? Anybody agree with Michelle? So Michelle, what do you recognize as the mere exposure effect? Put it in your own words. I mean, probably because she just got recently introduced to it. So now she, it's on her mind a lot more than had she not been or it not recently been, oh, she not recently been aware of it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very well put. And so I think all of us, um, have confronted this type of cognitive bias. And this was indeed the mere exposure effect. The more you're exposed to something, the greater the preference you have for, for choosing it. It's also known as the familiarity principle. And it's really the whole reason behind pharmaceutical detailing and also the whole foundation of commercial ads. How many of us have been bombarded with a medical ad just watching a show on on TV, or looking at something on YouTube, or um, or even uh, driving down the highway, the mere exposure effect is the foundation for that. And the the truth of the matter is, there is bias that's introduced whenever we're exposed to something. And um, maybe there's a relationship with the mere exposure effect, with the bandwagon effect that we can all understand. Even in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as new therapies are introduced and we see other people using them, um, we, we feel the pressure, the bias to want to use them as well. So I think it's important to be aware of this potential cognitive bias when we decide on a treatment, to think independently when we're deciding on the best option, and also to be aware of the power of influence from commercial interests. And that is what the mere exposure effect is. And just to talk about some of the other biases that are um, that I also cho I also listed as options, fundamental attribution error is the tendency to believe what people do reflects who they are. So 
if we if if we have a patient that makes a bad choice, we automatically have the tendency to make a judgment on their character, and we need to avoid that. As we said before, all humans are fallible. Status quo bias is when people prefer for things to stay the same by doing nothing um, or by sticking with a decision made previously. I could recommend this treatment, but it would affect the status quo, and it could end up changing the situation for the worse. It's oftentimes a reason why physicians do nothing. When they need to consider the fact that maybe a treatment could have a potential risk, but it could ultimately improve the patient's situation above the status quo. Hindsight bias, hindsight bias is overestimating one's ability to have foreseen the outcome. It's what we know as the I knew it all along phenomenon. Well, if I had, you know, in hindsight, I feel this way. Well, that's really a bias because really we have to look at all the options that were available when we didn't know about that outcome um, rather than having the foresight of, of being in a position to offer hindsight bias. And information bias is, um, is basically what happens when we have bad information. It's distortion of the measurement of association when key variables are inaccurately measured or classified. All right, well, we've gotten down to our last question. We just have a couple of minutes here. A 48-year-old renal transplant patient with respiratory symptoms, fever, and cough is moved into respiratory precautions during a COVID surge on suspicion of COVID. He repeatedly tests negative, but has close family contacts who have recently recovered from the coronavirus. Despite, despite remdesivir, dexamethasone, and respiratory therapy, he worsens and is intubated. After clearing COVID precautions, he is finally taken for bronchoscopy. A, bronchos a bronchial washing sample is PCR positive for pneumocystis uh, herovicii. He's finally started on IV Bactrim and recovers. So unfortunate transplant patient, suspicion of COVID, doesn't get a bronchoscopy until he clears COVID precautions, ends up having a different diagnosis. So is this availability bias, ego bias, information bias, overconfidence bias, or playing the odds? So in the interest of time, um, I'll, uh, I'll just give you the answer. This turns out to be availability bias. So availability bias is when we overdiagnose a condition because it is common and, and we fail to consider other possibilities because they have not been seen recently. So in other words, um, a lot of times when we were in the COVID surge, we saw a patient with a particular uh, category of symptoms and said, we're in a COVID surge, so it must be COVID. And we tended to, to not consider other possibilities that we might easily consider outside of the COVID surge. So this is the fallacy of believing that common things occur commonly. And so the availability bias ideas, we rely on immediate examples to come to mind while making judgments. We don't consider others that are less common. And so to avoid availability bias, we need to consider a diagnosis on its own merits and not on what you have recently seen. And I know this is difficult to do, but it's really important to avoid a misdiagnosis. Consider other things. Don't assume because we're in a COVID surge that everything is COVID. Now, just briefly to talk about um, some other uh, cognitive biases that I didn't mention. Ego bias, that's the tendency of people to rely too heavily on their own perspective and to have a higher opinion of oneself than in reality. Um, maybe we feel that we don't have ego bias. Maybe we identify it in others. But all of us, to a certain extent, have an ego, and we may be we may fall susceptible to ego bias. And um, overconfidence bias, that's over West, overestimating our own abilities more so than another person. In other words, we have, ex, we have confidence in our ability to make a diagnosis more so than in others because we're us. And lastly, playing the odds is relying on a benign diagnosis due to the belief that it is much more common. In other words, thinking, well, this is not a malignancy, because, um, you know, more often than not, uh, that judgment turns out to be correct. 
Um, the odds are this will not be a malignancy. It won't be cancer. It won't be a certain diagnosis just because we're playing the odds. And, uh, and oftentimes we recognize situations in the past when that's not the case. So that's availability bias. And lastly, to close, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to talk about other cognitive biases to be aware of, kind of a lightning round, and uh, have you all uh, yell out an answer. What is self-serving bias? And I'm just going to keep this short in the interest of time. Um, self-serving bias is believing that our failures are situational, but our successes are our responsibility. So in other words, when when we succeed, it's all on us. It's our skill. But when we fail, it's due to another factor, like maybe in a test situation, we haven't gotten enough sleep or we were tired or um, or some other factor led to us being wrong. Does anybody familiar with automation bias? That's when we rely on automated systems too much. We trust the algorithm or our smartphone app and we don't trust our own informed opinion or decision or our analytical ability to make a diagnosis. That's what's known as automation bias. Does anybody know what declinism is? This is common here in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's the belief that we romanticize the past and view the present or future negatively, believing that societies and institutions are by and large in decline. So we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and everything in medicine and everything in, in society stinks. Oh, if we only um, lived in the past when things made more sense, there wasn't a pandemic, and things were seen in a more romantic light. That's what's known as declinism. We talked about uh, status quo bias, so I'm going to skip that one. The bystander effect, that's, um, we, we're all familiar with that. The more people are around, the less likely that we are to help a victim. If we're in a busy ICU and a code is called, Certainly, all these other people will rush to the patient's aid. The code team is here. We don't need to participate. That's the bystander effect. Survivorship bias is when we tend to focus on things that survived a process and overlooked ones that failed. For example, we think about a, tr a novel treatment that we have, and we remember the one time that it succeeded, or a risky surgery for that matter, and we don't remember all the patients that had a poor outcome. Clustering illusion is when we see patterns and clusters in random data. It's kind of like finding the, the picture of the deity in the potato chip or, you know, the, the deity on the side of, of the wall because our minds are designed to see patterns and, and that's why we have clustering illusion. And the Google effect is something I fall susceptible to. That's when we forget things that we can look up on search engines. They call that the Google effect. And finally, reactance. Reactance is the oppositional nature that we all have. We do the opposite of what we're told, especially when we perceive threats to personal freedoms. And this is one reason why vaccine mandates meet with an opposition in a lot of society. They don't like being told what to do. So we tend to do the opposite of what we're told. And blind spot bias, lastly to close, is when we don't think we have bias and we see it in others more than ourselves. So all of you can search for um, this uh, web page in visualcapitalist.com, 50 cognitive biases in the modern world. And they have some of the pictograms I've used in this presentation. You can keep it to yourself and, and you can learn more types of cognitive bias and hopefully um, not fall susceptible to them in your own practice and in your own life. And these are some uh, sources that I came upon along with links, and I'm happy to share this presentation with anyone that's interested. So we've gone a little bit past our time, but I hope that this presentation has been helpful, and I hope that you all have learned something about cognitive biases.